Hello, and welcome to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I am your host, Mr. Miller. This podcast will cover a number of topics that happened on this date in history. Please visit the podcast webpage at thishappentoday.buzzsprout.com. There you can download the notes page, which will help you organize the information, as well as develop your own ideas on how these events change the world around us. If you're interested in hearing more, please consider subscribing so you will not miss out on what happens tomorrow in history. Today is March 31st. The Eiffel Tower opened to the public on March 31st, 1889, but it had been generating controversy for years before that. Today it's an icon, but at the time, the project was deemed a disaster by France's best aesthetic minds and seen as a World's Fair gimmick that would hopefully be demolished as soon as possible. The story started in 1886 when France held a contest for a striking centerpiece at the 1889 World's Fair that would celebrate the downfall of the Bastille. Entrepreneur Gustave Eiffel entered the running. He had experience building railroad bridges, and his proposal for a new monument, a tower, looked extremely industrial and was an unlikely entry in a field that already included some unusual competition. Another proposed monument was a massive model of a guillotine. As it turned out, French officials liked Eiffel's plan because he had technical experience and expertise and an ambition to set new records for height. The whole thing, to Eiffel, was that the French would have the tallest building in the world, says Joe Jonas, author of Eiffel's Tower. It would be twice as tall, and he knew technically how to do this. But through Eiffel's Tower plan to set records, it wasn't without controversy. The building was radically industrial, and that chafed against the sensibilities of more refined Parisians. The aggressively modern plans for the tower inspired intellectuals and artists to battle against it in an over-the-top letter in 1887. The new building created a clash between France's artistic and industrial voices. As Eiffel's grand experiment dominated the Paris skyline, responses were fierce from French intellectuals and writers. One of the history's most famous short story authors was unsparing in his early criticism of the Eiffel Tower. The critique from artists was so scathing that Gustave Eiffel himself eventually felt the need to respond. Eiffel's response appeared in Le Temps in 1887, where he tendered an artistic and intellectual defense to his tower. As construction of the tower progressed, it became easier to see the real impact it would make upon the Parisian landscape. Once it was two-thirds up, Jonas says, opinions began to come around. By late 1888, it was possible to see the shape of the Eiffel Tower and excitement for the 1889 World's Fair was building in the city. The tower was finished incredibly quickly. In total, it took two years, two months, and five days to build. Its legacy has lasted much longer. In 1951, the first commercially built U.S. computer, the UNIVAC-1, which stands for the Universal Automatic Computer 1, is sold to the United States Census Bureau, costing about $159,000 U.S. The Census Bureau continued to use updated versions of Herman Hodler's 1890 electric counting machine through the 1940 census. Processing and tabulation technology took a great leap forward during World War II, when the War Department, the precursor to the Department of Defense, began to explore the use of electronic digital computers to process ballistic information. After the war, many of that project's engineers foresaw the peacetime benefits of such a device. Computers had the ability to far outstrip the processing speeds of older non-digital counting machines. Their efforts brought the Census Bureau into the computer age. During the ENIAC project, Mouchley met with several Census Bureau officials to discuss non-military applications for electronic computing devices. In 1946, with the ENIAC completed, Mouchley and Eckert were able to secure a study contract from the National Bureau of Standards to begin work on a computer designed for use by the Census Bureau. This study, originally scheduled for six months, took about a year to complete. The final result were specifications for the Universal Automatic Computer, also known as UNIVAC. UNIVAC was, an effective, was effectively an updated version of the ENIAC. Data could be input using magnetic computer tape and, by the early 1950s, punch cards. It was tabulated using vacuum tubes and state-of-the-art circuits then, either printed out or stored on more magnetic tape. Mouchley and Eckert began building UNIVAC 1 in 1948, and a contract for the machine was signed by the Census Bureau on March 31st of 1951, and a dedication ceremony was held in the June of that year. 
Univac 1 was soon used to tabulate part of the 1950s population census and the entire 1954 economic census. Throughout the 1950s, Univac also played key role in several monthly economic surveys. The computer excelled at working with the repetitive but intricate mathematics involved in weighing and sampling for these surveys. Univac 1, as the first successful civilian computer, was a key part in the dawn of the computer age. Despite early delays, the UNIVAC program at the Census Bureau was a great success. The Bureau purchased a second UNIVAC-1 machine in the mid-1950s and two UNIVAC-1105 computers for the 1960 census. And in this article from Canada History Project, Canada from sea to sea became a reality in 1949 when Newfoundland joined the Confederation. Although it was the newest province, its capital, St. John's, is the oldest city in Canada. European fishermen have been coming to the shores of the Grand Banks for hundreds of years. Our 10th province had held out a long time. It declined Confederation in the 1860s, feeling quite logically that its outlook was to the Atlantic and to England. It had very little to do with the other North American colonies. The issue came up again in the 1890s when poor cod prices put the island into bad financial straits. The idea of joining the rich provinces of Canada had some appeal, but not enough to convince Newfoundlanders to give up their independence. Economic problems have been a constant plague on Newfoundland. In in the depths of the Depression, it was forced to give its dominion status and go back to being a colony of Great Britain so that England would cover its debts. After the Second World War, the debate began again. Most people wanted to change the current colonial status, which included government by appointed officials from England, but some wanted a responsible government with economic links to the United States. Others wanted to join Canada. The leading confederationist was a feisty broadcaster and labor leader, Joey Smallwood. After two BBS after two plebeasties, confederation won by a narrow margin. At the time Newfoundland joined with Canada, the average income there was one-third of the Canadian average and the death rate associated with diseases of poverty was two to three times higher. Smallwood promised reforms in the new province enjoying the economic benefits of hydroelectric projects, foreign investment, injections of federal money, and improvements in the educational system. Some of the promised gains were never delivered, though, and not all the changes were welcomed. Modernization took its toll on the unique culture of the outport communities, as Gordon Pinsent portrayed in his film John and the Misses, and economic difficulties continued to beset Canada's 10th province. You have been listening to the This Happened Today in History podcast. I thank you for listening, and I hope that you have enjoyed learning about historical events from the past. Thank you to the following websites for their information regarding today's topics. ThePeopleHistory.com Eiffel Tower at Vox.com Univac Computer at TheCensus.gov and Newfoundland Labrador from the Canada History Project.ca The music used as the background track for this podcast is Americana, created by Kevin McLeod on Incompetech.com. If you enjoyed this information and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing as this will keep the historical events in your feed in the morning for each day. I hope you have a great day.